God's peace to you on this 12th Sunday after Pentecost. Our text this morning is taken from St. Matthew, the 16th chapter, verses 13 through 20. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. Google it. If this COVID pandemic continues, it's going to kill the church. I've heard this uh, fearful opinion and about a dozen variations of it. We can't gather anymore, so people will find other entertainment and not return. If God can allow this pandemic to continue, he's going to become irrelevant and people will have no good reason to follow him. The bonds of friendship have been strained or broken because we can't have coffee hour. Secular authorities are restricting our gathering in order to kill the church. The building is shut. The office is closed. We're just not the church anymore. We're out of sight and out of mind. People will forget us. The death of our church is looming before us. And after a few hours of Googling, you might actually begin to think that the church is already dead. One gospel word out of all of these law-filled fears was a meme that simply said, the church will not reopen because it never closed. Pan was the god of shepherds. And worship of Pan included participation in his favorite activities, which included sex, music, musical improvisation, or what the kids today call freestyling, sex, he's the god of artistic uh, critical reviews, sex, and the god of naps. This half goat, half man god wasn't much of an indoor temple god. His temples were open air courtyards. Pan was usually worshipped in natural settings like caves and grottos and other outdoor places. Caesarea Philippi was built near a particular grotto at the bottom of Mount Hermon. And the cave contained, at the time, a spring that gushed water and became the headwaters of the Banas River, uh, which is a major tributary of the Jordan River. And the water was said to be so deep in that cave that there was no rope long enough to plumb the depth of it, according to historians. False gods have been worshipped on that spot for nearly a thousand years. Before Pan, King Jeroboam had set up a temple for worship of a golden calf there. And after that, the Greeks and the Romans brought their gods there. So that by the time Jesus and his disciples are there, 
there was a strip mall of worship spots outside this cave. There was a temple built to the god Caesar Augustus. Pan's courtyard, a temple to Zeus. And on the other side of that, two more courtyards of the dancing goats, where the goats were ritually bred as part of worship. Surrounding these temples, niches were carved uh, into the surrounding rock cliffs to serve as shrines for idols. And testimonials to the false gods were carved into the rocks. You can imagine how upsetting all of this was uh, to a bunch of Jews who followed Jesus and knew well that God had commanded no worship of other gods. And when I say they worshipped idols, this was not some gathering of pagans sitting around some potluck table and togas uh, feasting and singing songs to a statue as romantic painters might depict them. Now, this was actually a really evil place. Greeks thought it was the entrance to Hades, the land of the dead where death rules. People threw their babies into that cave, sacrificing their children to Pan. They literally threw their own children into the mouth of hell. Those dancing goat courtyards uh, put on more of a public display than just rutting goats. Their dancing rituals included the shepherds. To the disciples, it was about the most evil, unholy, profane place Jesus could have brought them. And for that reason, they agreed. The name of the place fit. The gates of Hades. Or as Jesus has it in our text today, the gates of hell. Our text begins. Now Jesus, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi. It sounds like they just happened to be strolling along one day and just stumbled upon the place. Nothing could be further from the truth. They have traveled some 60 or 70 miles from the shores of Galilee to get to the gates of hell. This was a destination spot. So while his disciples were likely viewing the pagan rituals and reading all the profane testimonies to pan engraved on the walls, Jesus decides to Google his disciples. Who do the people say that the Son of Man is? Jesus usually substitutes the phrase Son of Man for the title Messiah. He gets a bunch of search results. His disciples tell him uh, what the people are saying about Messiah. He's John the Baptist, Jeremiah, Elijah. They toss around the names of many prophets who the people have said Jesus is like. Then Jesus dials down his question. But who do you all say that I am? And at this moment, they all fall silent. They search their hearts, they rack their brains, and they come up with nothing. But then Peter, out of his mouth pops these words. You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus could have asked him, where did you get that from, Peter? No one could have told you that. These words or a confession of faith. But the sermon that Peter preaches certainly didn't come from his own brain or his heart. That word came from God. 
That's what Jesus says. Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. Jesus never called himself Son of God. Jesus knows that the only one who knows that Jesus is the Son of God is the one who called him by that name at baptism, the Father. Blessed are you, Simon. This word, this sermon, did not come out of you, Peter, but instead was put into you by my Father in heaven. In the middle of this filthy, sinful place, Jesus hears the gospel preached by a human mouth for the first time. He knows that this simple word coming from the mouth of a sinner spoken to a crowd of sinners will change the foundation of everything. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, this foundation, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And with that word, a church springs into life. It wasn't a building. Jesus and Peter didn't start measuring for the walls for a grand cathedral. They didn't pull down the idols and establish a Christian monument for worship there. In fact, pagan worship continued there for the next 500 years. They weren't establishing a church hierarchy as uh, some Roman Catholics teach where Jesus is somehow using this time to work out an organizational flow chart with Peter at the top and all the other disciples as lesser popes who will then rule over lesser bishops who will rule over priests and so on until the smallest and lowliest in the pecking order are merely the baptized. The word church in that sense isn't going to exist for a few hundred years. Jesus' church is the assembly that has at its as its foundation a word. A word that doesn't come from human hearts. The Father has put that word into their mouths to make faith in the ears of all who hear it. This church will preach Jesus as Savior and Son of the living God. Jesus seems so blown away that Peter has just preached that word that he goes on to give them all a promise. He is, after all, the God of promises. And when this happens, Jesus says, when his gospel comes out of the mouth of a sinner, and into the ears of a sinner, you have church. Sin, death, and the devil, and even the gates of hell will not prevail against that church. So if Google and your friends, or even I, your pastor, tell you that COVID will be the end of the church, or immorality will be the end of the church, or the government will be the end of the church. Or anything will be the end of the church. We're preaching that Jesus is a liar. The gates of hell will not prevail against the church standing on the rock of his word. Notice he did not say that the church is going to crush the enemy. The church will struggle, but prevail. In fact, it may look for most of the time like the church is losing, bruised, bloodied up some. They will knock us down, persecute us, ignore us, mock us, dismiss us, 
but they will not overcome the word that we have in our mouths because they cannot overcome the Father, the author of those words. Then Jesus goes just a little bit too far for some of the disciples. More on that later. He doesn't just tell them to preach the foundation that he is a savior and son of the living God. He tells them how to build on that foundation. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. He's telling them how to preach. My wife and I didn't live together before we were married. But I've had more than a few friends who measured the seriousness of their relationship with their house keys. When do you give a key to the boyfriend or the girlfriend? It's a big commitment. Give them a key and they can just come and go as they please. Give them a key. They might just barge in on you when you're wanting to be alone. Now that you are church, Jesus says, I give you the keys to the kingdom. You will be able to open up the kingdom of God or lock it away by binding and loosing. This phrase was used by the rabbis to describe the work of interpreting the law by binding and loosing, meaning to forbid or permit. By an indisputable authority, the law, you declare that a meal is permissible, clean, or you declare it is against the law, unclean. But this confession, this word of Peter's, is not about the law. Everything that Jesus is saying here is outside the law completely. In the middle of this God-forsaken, unclean place, Jesus gave his followers the thing that the law cannot touch, a promise for sinners. Preach to them. Thus says the Lord, the Son of the living God, our Savior, I have chosen to forgive you. Give them a word of law that binds them to their sins, but give them a promise of forgiveness that releases them from their sins. Forgive them their sins. And whenever, wherever, to whomever, this word of absolution is spoken, you have the church. And neither sin, death, the devil, nor even the gates of hell will prevail against you. You have Christ's word on that. So, as a called and ordained sinner of the Church of Christ, and certainly not by my word or authority at all, but by the authority of Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, our Savior, thus says the Lord, your sins are forgiven. Amen.